So uh, welcome everyone. As I said before, um, please stay on mute. And um, when it's time to ask questions, we'll ask that you kind of raise your hand via the chat and uh, then I'll give you the go ahead to unmute yourself or I'll unmute you. So we'll begin. So I am Mike Hunter. I'm a member of this organization that's presenting this talk. It's called Tempo. I should probably make sure people can see me here. Uh, I'll add myself as a pin. Uh, I'm a member of Tempo. I'm the host of the WPRB radio program, Music with Space. I'm an advisor at the Electronic Music Education and Preservation Product uh, Project at meapp.org, and I record under the name Ambient. Tempo, or the Electro Music Performers Organization, is an emerging 5013C not-for-profit organization created to foster and promote the development of electro music, music ethos through the organization and presentation of live performances, seminars, lectures, exhibits, and gatherings. Temple will support uh, the enhancement of electro music as a art in our age and contributing to the cultural, educational, spiritual, and emotional content of our communities. We define electro music as music that is made with synthesizers, all made circuits, computers, found objects, voices, signal processors, wooden flutes, field recordings, virtually anything imaginable that makes sound, even conventional orchestras. It could be slow and spacey or fast and rhythmic. It crosses many genres. The primary motivation for the creation of tempo was artistic and spiritual expression. Tonight, we're honored to welcome Robert Rich to our series of educational seminars. Across four decades and over 50 albums, Robert has helped define the genre of ambient music, dark ambient, tribal, and trance. Yet his music remains hard to categorize. Part of his unique sound comes from using homemade acoustic and electronic instruments, microtonal harmonies, computer-based signal processing, chaotic systems, and feedback networks. Rich began building his own analog synthesizers in 1976 when he was 13 years old and later studied for a year at Stanford Center for Computer Research in Music and Acoustics. Boy, that background noise is, that, that beeping is annoying. <laughs> Rich released his first album, Sun Yada, in 1982. Most, uh, most of his subsequent recordings came out in Europe until 1989 when Rich began a string of critically acclaimed releases for Fathoms and Hearth, Hearts of Space, including Rainforest, Gaudi, Propagation, Seven Veils, his two collaborations with Steve Roach, Strata, and Soma, and both charted for several months on Billboard. Other respected collaborations include Stalker with B. Lustmord, Fissures with Ali O.D., and Outposts with Ian Bonney. Rich's contributions to multi-artist compilations have been collected on his solo albums, A Troubled Resting Place, Below Zero. His group Amoeba explored atmospheric songcraft on their CDs Watchful and Pivot, Live albums such as Calling Down the Sky and the three CD Humidity document the unique improvised flow of his performance. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. And uh, without further ado, Robert, you can uh, take it away. Well, hello, everybody. Thank you. Um, I intended to make this really, really casual, uh, in, in part because I, I haven't performed live except for the thing for Steve Roach's SoundQuest Festival in April. Uh, I haven't performed live since November of 2019, uh, like a lot of people. <laughs> and so my my live chops are are pretty crunchy right now, <laughs> to say the least. And um, I've been working really slowly in the studio on my own next projects and on uh, other people's mastering projects. I'm also doing a bunch of sound design for uh, synthesizer company. Uh, I, I've signed a non-disclosure, so I can't talk about that. In fact, I had to hide the, the synthesizer from my work surface here so that nobody could see it. <laughs> um, but one, one of the other, you know, I, when I'm not working on my own music, I stay busy doing sounds for people's presets and things like that, and especially sequential um, Dave Smith instruments, sequential a AKA, um, but also for Paul Schreiber and uh, uh, synthesis technology, and I can talk about that. So if anybody's interested in the new algorithms we're developing for uh, some of the modules, uh, E520 uh, Hyperion processor, which makes me laugh that name, but uh, we've got some some prototype uh, reverb algorithms running uh, thanks to Eric Brombaugh and his incredible coding skills. Um, but I, I set up a couple quick things just to, a lot of people, who haven't seen me perform live uh, have expressed curiosity of certain sounds that I've used for years and years. 
Um, uh, the, the glissando guitar is probably the, the main one. Um, and uh, another thing I can speak about a little bit is microtonality and uh, the, the new album that I released uh, in December and then the, the record, uh, this one, uh, Neurogenesis, came out uh, finally in early May. Uh, I got my copies after a six month delay time of pressing because the pandemic uh, messed up all of the international shipping of plastics, it turned out. Everybody was short of acrylic and they couldn't ma manufacture vinyl for a while. Um, so that album is very much heavily using just intonation tuning systems. And I can talk a little bit about the story of our efforts to get tunings into the synthesizers that people are using. Um, that story goes back almost 40 years. Um, so, uh, but first of all, I, I figured I would uh, just do a very quick little uh, demo of, of some of the fretless instruments, because a lot of the way I think about sound involves the human voice and about singing. Um, I'm very, very influenced by Indian classical music, uh, which is primarily based on a single melody over a drone. Um, it's prim primarily modal, and that means that everything is hovering around one key. Um, but it allows huge amounts of expression within that very simple framework of drone and melody. And of course, we can't forget rhythm and cycles of rhythm. So be because as a singer, I'm very limited, and anybody who's heard my group project Amoeba can attest that I'm a very limited singer. So um, what I do is I, I find things like, like flute um, and I make my own flutes out of plastic pipe and also things like these instruments, which are fretless instruments, um, including Hawk and Continuum and, and the Gliss guitar and, and also just lap steel guitar. So in general, hopefully you can hear that okay. I've got the sound going through uh, the computer, so. So this is kind of more of a standard with a lot of processing, of course, um, way to play guitar. But uh, back when I was just starting out as a teenager, I started playing with uh, my good friend, Rick Davies. We started playing really weird, noisy, experimental music. And he had just come from university in England at the University of Essex. And he had been playing in a band with uh, some folks that were in the Here and Now band, which were friends of Gong. In fact, Gong did the Anarchy, Flying Anarchy 77 album with the Here and Now band. And Rick Davies showed me David Allen's glissando guitar technique. Of course, David Allen was using a, a knife handle and a Fender Strat. Um, I found myself looking for cheap lap steel guitars, and so I went to a used a uh, music store and found a $60 mother of toilet seat lap steel. Not this one, this one I bought in 1988, I think from Jaron Lanier. But Gliss guitar technique uses a uh, slightly textured polished steel. And in this case, what I'm using is a custom built uh, rod that a friend of mine who is an inventor, he invented the Aerobee, in fact. Um, he's, uh, he, he has a, a machine shop. And we machined together a bunch of these special bars that I can hold with my gimpy right hand. And they're polished down, uh, braided with the uh, machining and then polished. So they make a very nice, clear. And then of course, you can go all the way across. Or just play the low note. So the kinds of patches through the pedal that work best for this kind of thing are generally uh, without a lot of distortion, sometimes just a little bit of tube saturation to bring out the harmonics. 
um, and it needs a lot of gain, so a lot more gain than you usually need for playing a normal guitar. So if I were to strum this guitar at full level right now, it would clip the algorithm. Um, so I, I generally have to create several different um, pedal presets to, to work on that. Now what I do is I have a switcher. Um, so for live performance, I'll have the Hawken continuum going right through the guitar pedals. And this gives me a kind of option to, to do the sim similar things. And it's also polyphonic, of course. The reason I've been enjoying playing the Hawken through the guitar pedals is that I can use my old habits of writing gain with the volume pedal, because I've been playing lap steel guitar for so long that, that the volume pedal is just second nature. And although the Hawken gives me a lot of control over, over gain, you know, with the uh, pressure and also vibrato is completely natural. Once I put it through the guitar pedal, then I can use all of my completely natural instincts and I don't really have to think like a different instrument. So really the Hawken becomes uh, like lap steel guitar in, in my brain and I can do all sorts of similar things with it. So if I were to go out here to uh, a sound that is like a more distorted Ebo sound. So on the guitar, this would be, you know, for something a little bit more, let me turn this off here. And a little wah wah. And harmonics. And so a lot of those same techniques, I can just bring them right over to the Hawken with a sound like this one, for example. And you can hear how it's jumping into harmonics there. So I'm really doing almost exactly the same thing on the continuum as I am with the Ebo on the guitar. So that's been methods these days for um, continuing this developed idea of um, vocal-like expressions using electric instruments or electronic instruments. Um, and, you know, part, part of it is that I, I just love modal music and I love music that has these kinds of very expressive um, lead lines. Um, and I, I just like the way that uh, sounds communicate when they resemble the human voice. And so that's one reason why flute's also been a major thing. I'm going to reach around here and grab. So uh, another thing that people express a lot of curiosity about is these uh, PVC flutes that I've been making for years. Um, and, and the story of these, I can just show you one, for example, here. So they're, they're very primitive and very simple. They're basically made of plumbing material. And um, Lately, because I, uh, I've been sensitive about the amount of plastics that we use as a culture, I've actually been making some of these uh, flutes out of, uh, out of recycled plastic. So the, um, uh, sometimes if, if neighbors pull a uh, sprinkler pipe out of the ground when they're replacing their, their irrigation, um, I'll, I'll pull these things out of the garbage <laughs> and, uh, and wash them up really well and, you know, sand them. And uh, in, in this case, what, what happens is we uh, manage to get some plastic out of the waste stream, 
but also uh, I, I sometimes make mistakes when I'm making flutes, and so I feel a little bit less guilty about of you know adding so many uh, chunks of plastic into the waste stream as well. But um, but there's nothing special about these. It's Schedule 40 PVC pipe. Um, these are one inch pipe. Uh, sometimes I work with three quarter inch, and for the really low ones, I'll sometimes use one and a half inch. Um, and then there's nothing to to do about it except some plumbing parts like some plugs here, and and a drill with multiple bit sizes. And so I'll start with small bits, um, and then enlarge the hole until it's in tune. And when I'm working on prototype flutes, I sometimes make mistakes, and I'll just and I'll plug up the mistakes with cork. So you can see right here. There's a hole that I drilled that's in the right location, but unfortunately I couldn't reach it with my fingers. <laughs> so, be, because these are primitive flutes, um, the point being that because these are simple primitive flutes, I don't have um, like the, the levers and fingers, fingering systems that are on modern orchestral instruments. And in fact, with my, this hand doesn't work very well because I injured it really badly about 15 years ago. Um, and so I have to work around those injuries. And so what I do is I, I make these flutes with thumb holes. And so this one, as you can see, I've drilled a hole that I can actually reach. And the end result is pretty decent. Excuse my crummy playing. I'm not practiced right now, um, but uh, this way I can also retune these for different microtonal scales, um, and assuming that I can play them well enough in tune to begin with, because I am not a great flute player, um, nor am I really a great player of anything. But um, but using the wonders of digital processing and the wonders of editing, I can make it sound pretty decent. Um, and the the tunings then sometimes if I need to get a tuning that that I can't reach with my mouth and with my lungs, I will use uh, auto-tune or the, the tuning feature that's built into Logic, which has micro-tuning capabilities, which is very handy. Um, so uh, that's just a, a brief uh, you know, introduction to these funny pieces of plastic that people see me play. Um, it's, th th there's, there's a story about that, which is I learned how to play flute uh, back when I was about 17 years old. And I grew up right near Stanford campus, Stanford University in Palo Alto. And um, I used to go onto campus often when I was in high school to go to the bookstore there, which had an amazing import record collection uh, that for sale. The, the, the undergraduate buyer who was uh, working for the bookstore happened to have an amazing fondness for European electronic music back in the 70s. And I could go to the Stanford university bookstore and find these obscure imports for really cheap prices <laughs> like things from egg records and brain and you know so all of these uh you know early uh tangerine dream albums that were on brain and completely un unavailable elsewhere you know it's where you discovered you know klaus schultz and gong and all of this stuff so i'd go on campus pretty often to look through the record store uh in the bookstore and there was a itinerant salesman there were these folks on Treseder Plaza selling everything from, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, pipes for smoking <clears throat> illicit substances to, uh, you know, batik dresses and t-shirts and tie-dye and stuff like that, kind of a little bazaar, you know. And uh, one of the folks selling things there was this guy named Daryl DeVore, who looked like a shaman. He had beady eyes and a little gray goatee and shaved head. He was in his mid fifties and he was uh, making bamboo flutes and he would call it bamboo magic. <laughs> and and Daryl, I, I didn't realize at the time, was a, 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 a well-respected improvising jazz musician in the, in the free jazz movement in the sixties. And um, in the late seventies, he was making things out of bamboo and selling them on university campuses. And he taught me how to play flute. I used to sit down and try to play his bamboo flutes. And I still have all of the flutes that I bought from him. I can't play them all anymore because my fingers can't reach the holes with this injury. But um, I used to, I, I, I bought a $6, very small bamboo flute from him, which is over in the corner still. And I would 
go over to to the lake that's on campus called Lake Lagunita, which means Lake Little Lake, and um, and I would just practice, and I would you know sit in the farthest corner of campus that I could, away from everybody, and try to get a sound out of this little piece of bamboo until I could finally play it. And uh, <laughs> ironically, when when I uh, met my first girlfriend as a junior in college, two or three years later, uh, she saw my instruments and stuff. And she said, did you know anything about like flute playing that was out on the lake like two years ago? And I said, yeah, that was me. <laughs> so it all comes around sometimes. Um, but uh, Daryl DeVore went on to be somewhat uh, important in that he turned uh, Tom Waits onto uh, experimental musical instruments. What happened was that Daryl was also teaching what he called sound magic um, for at kindergarten and first grade uh, art classes around the Sonoma and Marin County School District, the public school district. And at the time, Tom Waits and his family were living in Sonoma, and uh, I think in um, Sevastopol or something like that. And his kids were going to the public schools there. And the kids came back from school one day and said, there's this guy teaching us how to make instruments out of rubber bands and film canisters and soda straws. And so Tom Waits went over to the school the next time that, that Darrow was teaching one of these classes for first graders and they became friends. And so basically a guy named Bart Hopkin who was writing a magazine called Experimental Musical Instruments and Daryl DeVore went over to the recording studio where Tom Waits was working on Bone Machine and loaned him a lot of their instruments and played a lot of them on the album. And also the percussionists that Tom Waits were working with were playing a lot of Daryl's bamboo instruments on, on Bone Machine and on several of the later Tom Waits albums in the 80s. So it's kind of a fun connection there with, with Daryl. He eventually, he died around the late 90s or 2000 of lung cancer because he was a constant smoker. And, um, uh, but, but he was a dear friend and a, uh, a, a, one, one of my mentors. Um, I, sh I should also mention that uh, I was showing you Gliss guitar a little earlier and uh, I consider David Allen from Gong to be one of my mentors as well. And uh, in 2012, my wife Dixie and I were uh, in Australia for a month doing concerts. I had about eight concerts over there. And uh, David and Jilly were both living in Byron Bay uh, on the southeast coast of Australia. Uh, he's Australian originally, even though he got known mostly for the Canterbury scene in the 60s for starting Soft Machine and, and Gong. Uh, and the, the person who was driving us around Byron Bay said, oh, I've played with David. Let me introduce you to him. And so we drove over. He, he, he called him and, we, and it was Thursday and apparently it was family, uh, family happy hour day. <laughs> so we went over to David's apartment. David and Jilly haven't, they were never married and they were not even together as a couple after about 1975 or something, but they still remained very good friends and played in Gong together all this time. And Orlando, their son, um is was drumming in gong at the time in in this is in 2012 now and anyway we, we went over to, to david's house and brought him a bottle of wine because it was going to be family happy hour and we just chatted for the entire evening we hung out with jilly before she was getting alzheimer's at the time jilly Smythe, of course was the space whisperer of gong and um i was able to ask David about some of the stories that I had heard with him hanging out with Terry Riley in Paris in 1963, um, apparently selling anarchist newspapers <laughs> and um, making tape loops. They invented the tape loop, the thing that people think of as Fippertronics. And uh, David Allen and Terry Riley together basically were the first people to stick two tape machines with, you know, next to each other with a reel of tape to make an open, long delay tape loop. And I was able to to tell David that uh, you know I, I've been playing Gliss guitar for 30, 40 years already, and to, and I was able to thank him for uh, uh, for creating that technique of playing. and And instead of sounding at all, because David was just this wonderful open hippie, and he goes, "Oh man, you play it real well. We are blood. We're, we're brothers in the Gliss." <laughs> and, 
so it was really a joy, actually. I, I felt um, uh, very, very uh, a, a strong sense of a closed circle with that, uh, and a real sense of joy to be able to hang out with them. Uh, David died just three years later of uh, skin cancer, and Jilly a year later of Alzheimer's. And so uh, it was a real a rare window for us to, to be able to reconnect with, with them. Um, so we could open it up to any questions anybody has, or I could tell a story about alternate tunings and the MIDI tuning uh, standard, if that interests anybody. Uh, interests, I mean, no, at least a few of us, myself included, so go for it. Okay. Um, well, f f I'm sure everybody here knows what I'm talking about. What I'll, what I'll do first, though, is I'm going to just show you what a harmonic series sounds like over here. Um, so... We've got a bit of MIDI happening, just a second. Um, I just need to turn off a channel here. So basically, th these are the first harmonics of, this is an A55, so 55 hertz. And so octave, fifth, major, th or fourth, major third, minor third, etc. And up here, they're really, really close. Closer than a semitone. And up here, they're really, really close. But because these are all overtones of exactly the same frequency, if you play clusters, you'll hear ghost tones of that same A. You might not hear it with the zoom thing happening, but... Um, the reason why these synths are able to play these alternate tunings um, is an effort that several of us, not just me, you know, have been making since the mid 1980s. Um, I was hugely influenced by Terry Riley's album, Shri Camel, which came out in 1980. And I was just getting started with my own music. And when I first heard that, I, it blew my head off. I was absolutely enthralled by the sound of uh, the, the very narrow intervals on that album and the, the playing, which was virtuosic also. Um, and I had been listening a bit to uh, Indonesian gamelan music, especially Javanese gamelan, which had uh, made an inroads into the West Coast of the United States here with uh, people like Lou Harrison and with uh, several different uh, domestic gamelan orchestras. And also Harry Parch, of course, who'd been doing just intonation and 43 note per octave tunings with his own instruments since, since the 1920s who passed away in 1974. And, uh, and he left this legacy of, of very uh, just ear bending and psychologically fascinating music, really intense, like theater that resembled, um, you know, Chinese opera at times, although with, with libretto about hobos and an American uh, individualism. So uh, I started trying to make music in just intonation, but I didn't have any instruments that could do it. I had a, a Prophet 5 Rev 1, which could hardly even stay in, in equal temperament in tune longer than about 10 or 20 minutes. You'd have to recycle the, 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 the you'd have to turn the power on and off to get it to go back into tune. And of course the Paya modular system that I had built like, was never in tune. It couldn't tune for anything. Uh, so the only way I could play anything that was an alternate tuning was with the lap steel guitar, which I picked up real cheap. And I could open tuning, you know, the, the six strings on that. Um, and with the flutes that I was making. Uh, so when the Prophet 5 Rev 3 came out, uh, a, a guy was working at sequential circuits named uh, Chet Wood. And Chet was Terry Riley's organ tuner. And Chet was a, a brilliant programmer. And he was the one who managed to squeeze the whole operating system of the Prophet 5 into like 64K of, of ROM <laughs> and <laughs> running on a Z80 computer inside the thing. And I knew a lot of the folks at Sequential at the time because I was playing in a band with Rick Davies and um, he was working at Sequential and a bunch of other people. You know, I was this 16 year old kid just getting to know all these people, uh, you know, who were all five years older than me. I was very much out of my league. Um, but one of those guys that was working there was was ready to move on to another company and he took advantage of his purchase uh, privilege uh, to be able to buy it at 
um, employee cost a profit five in 1983. And, and he was very generous enough to let me buy it from him at that price, which was not something he was supposed to do. But that was my first tunable keyboard. And I recorded Numina with that in 1985 and uh, started working in just intonation with tunings that I could actually properly do. Um, but the problem was the math. Um, I uh, was, was you know, trying to figure out how to uh, do all these ratios and reduce the fractions all the time, and it was really tedious. Um, I, I took some tunings out of books and copied them into the Prophet 5 and then sold those tunings, or actually mostly gave them away, but sold a, a disc, or it was, it was a cassette that you had to upload with the cassette data recorder onto the Prophet 5, and I was giving those away for about $10, which was my cost, just to help people do alternate tunings. Um, and then in 1987, I, I wrote a HyperCard stack. If anybody remembers HyperCard on a Macintosh, it was, <laughs> it was a, like a user programming language. And it was something that would do the math. It would help me reduce the fractions. Um, and I had become friends with a bunch of crazy uh, microtonal composers around the San Francisco Bay Area. They were called the Just Intonation Network. Uh, there was a group of Gamelon musicians they called Other Music. And somebody who became a very dear friend, Carter Scholes, uh, Carter was uh, working out of Mills College and a brilliant, brilliant person, one of the smartest people I've ever known, uh, a, a challenging composer. He's also a science fiction writer, and you can find his science fiction books. Uh, they are interesting, mind-bending books, um, a very complex writing style. Um, but uh, in any case, Carter... Uh, helped me get my head around some of these questions of the mathematics and helped, he took over my little uh, hypercard stack, which we called Just Intonation Calculator. And he made it work really fast and added a whole bunch of features to it and took it over. Um, so Carter and I and a few other folks at the Just Intonation Network were talking about how to make more synthesizers tunable. There were only a handful of tunable synths. There was the Reina synth that, that uh, um, was uh, several let's see uh anyway it was it was very it was running on a apple one or apple two computer i think it was if i'm not mistaken um and uh lamont young was using the reina for his sound installations to create these huge clusters of overtones uh so i think maybe one of the other ones was the um uh uh, there was an additive synth, uh, shoot, uh, the, I, I've forgotten the, the name of it, but, but uh, Wendy Carlos was using it uh, to do some of her microtonal work, like on the album uh, Beauty and the Beast. Um, oh, shoot, the company's name was the guy who's also an um, MIT professor in AI. You, you guys all know what I'm talking about, I'm sure. Uh, anyway. Uh, ADS. Uh, uh, he, he's written, he's a futurist. He's written books on, on AI and stuff on, on artificial intelligence. Um, Kurzweil. Kurzweil. Thank you, Ray Kurzweil. I'm sorry. Sometimes I have name brain farts. So yeah, the Kurzweil uh, 250, the additive synth that was their first instrument, was tunable as well. And, and Wendy Carlos had two of them and, and did most of Beauty and the Beast on that. Um, so they were just precious few tunable synths. And I was working on ways to do it with MIDI mode four, like sending multi-channel information out, which is similar to the way some things are doing it now. Uh, that don't have microtuning. So anyway, I invited everybody I knew who lived in the San Francisco Bay Area to come to my house in, uh, it was springtime of 1989, I think. It might have been autumn of 1988. And and we had a, a lunch meeting. We bas I invited them over and, we, you know, made, made some snacks. And we sat around and discussed what composers needed in their different styles. And this was mostly more academic composers. Somebody was there from CCRMA at Stanford, the Computer Music Center. Um, people weren't always using just, just intonation. Some were using uh, like random tunings or big equal temperaments. Um, and they, you know, we were asking them, Carter Scholes and I were basically organizing this. And, and I was taking notes. I was just the secretary essentially asking questions like, what do you, what do you need essentially? You know, like, what kind of resolution is good enough? Um, 
you know, Lamont Young was saying that it had to have no beats within two years or something ridiculous, and we couldn't do that, right? So is a cent good enough? Is a half a cent, three cents? You know, the DX7 was only accurate to about 1.5 cents, 1.7, I think. Um, and some people said, no, that wasn't good enough. Other people said, well, it's going to have to do. And, you know, sort of made a list. And then essentially Carter Scholes went and pounded his head against a piece of paper and came up with a specification for MIDI, which we decided would be using the SysX specifications because it didn't require approval of anybody. SysX could be a company's proprietary message. Um, so the system exclusive protocol was a, a header basically that said, okay, now it's system exclusive, you can pay attention to it or not, you know, like an F7 and then go. And so, so what we did is we, we created a very polite, very open-ended system that people could accept or not and presented it to Chris Meyer, who happened to be an old friend from Sequential Circuit. And he was working at Roland at the time in 1990. And in the, the 1990 January NAM session in Anaheim, uh, I, was not a, I was not a member of the MMA, but uh, Chris Meyer was the head of the MMA, and Chris Myers, and he let me go up and do a talk uh, at the MMA meeting at the January NAM, And um, I presented the MIDI tuning specification to 80 engineers in a room <laughs> who knew nothing about microtuning, who all had their opinions about how it should be done. And I basically said, here's what all the composers who actually are using this want. And here, we did it for you. Here is everything you need, packetized. Just if you want to put it in your synthesizer, it's free. Just please, you know, accept it. And what Chris Myers did was essentially cajoled people into voting for it as an approved MIDI specification. And we got approval in 1991, I think. Um, and it uh, has been used by a total of about two different companies. <laughs> Three, EMU put it in their Proteus boxes. And, and that's partially because I was doing sampling for EMU for their Proteus synthesizers back in the mid nineties. And Sonic put it in their last couple synthesizers. And I know that we have someone here who was responsible for that. Uh, Steve Curtin, I see you there. You remember that, don't you? Steve Curtin is in the audience here. And he was another person fond of microtonal music. He was working for Ensonic at the time, invited me over to Pennsylvania when I was on tour back in 1996, was it? Maybe? <laughs> I forget. And uh, we, we managed to get it into one of the last uh, modules that Ensonic did. Um, and so they're also in the list of people who supported. And by the way, micro, uh, the ASR-10 and the EPS samplers always supported microtuning. And that's one reason why they were always my sampler of choice ever since 1989 or so when they were usable. So 1988. Um, and so Ensonic was always one of my go-to companies because they always had tuning in their sense. Um, and that, that question of whether something was tunable or not became the limiting factor for me when I was looking for equipment, when I wanted a new synth. There were so many good ones that were coming out, but none of them were tunable. And so I missed out on all these wonderful sounding um, synthesizers, especially like I love the sound of the Oberheims. You know, the Matrix 12 was an incredible keyboard, um, but it wasn't tunable. So I, I didn't have any Oberheim gear. Um, I only had the Proteus stuff from Emu because those were the only t tunable things from Emu. Um, I had Yamaha gear. I was doing a lot of FM things because Yamahas were tunable. So it limited my 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 uh, range of, of vocabulary. And to, to a certain extent, I think that's um, that's a good problem to have. And and my rule, my entire career has been to to try not to let the gear take over, and to try to keep a, a fairly minimal set up a minimal rig um, and not have too many choices so that I can get more deeply into into various things. So so that's the story about tuning. Um, and now, of course, we've got the tunings in sequential things. And partially that's because I'm working with sequential as a as a contractor doing sound design. And I provided the tunings that are in all the sequential keyboards right now. Um, so there's about six different sequential synths that are all tunable with 64 memories for tuning in them. Um, and uh, I provided all of those tunings and they're all erasable. You know, you can 
you can send your own with MIDI. There's applications that can, uh, you know, there's even a website that can do some translation for people into MTS specification. Um, the ASM Hydra synth is tunable, um, and they actually gave me one in, in return for testing their tuning abilities. Um, and of course, Paul Schreiber's synthesis technology is uh, tunable. The, um, the MIDI interface, the uh, MIDI to CV converter that he put out with the MOTM 15 some odd years ago is, has my tunings in it as well. So um, uh, anyway, I think what we should do is I should stop soloing here and you guys can um, ask me anything you want. Uh, and I'll let, I'll let Mike or Nick be the oh, arbiters of, of who, whose questions get through, I guess. Excellent. Maybe. Thank you. This has been great. Um, there is a button at the bottom of the Zoom screen called Reactions. And if you click that button, um, along with a bunch of emojis, you can also click the raise the hand icon. So if you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand and I will sweep through the list and look for that icon and I will unmute you so that it doesn't get too random access in here. So, uh, yeah, does anybody have any questions? All right, let's see, who do we got here? Okay, I'll start with Todd. And uh, Todd, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi there. Uh, can you hear me okay? My internet's a bit yep. small. Yes. Great. Hi, hi Robert. Um, first of all, I just want to say I, I'm a, a very big fan of yours. Um, when I was uh, 11 years old, I kind of credit you and Steve Roach with opening up a whole new world of electronic, experimental, and ambient music to me. And that's uh, pretty much changed the trajectory of my life. You know, I, I'm, I'm very sorry. passionate <laughs> about that kind of thing. I apologize. <laughs> yeah, don't don't be sorry at all. You just you just gave me a new obsession. <laughs> so, um, but um, yeah, so uh, um, it's something I'm very passionate, and I, I, I try to make my own music now. Um, and I was just interested in uh, maybe the apologies if this is kind of a broad question, but I, I'm just interested to hear some of your thoughts on mastering and especially mastering ambient music. Um, it's something that I have trouble wrapping my head around my own music. Um, and uh, I, when I try to master my music, I, I'm just using like digital tools like Isotope Ozone. Um, you know, That's I, don't, what I, use. I don't use any hardware. Uh, it, oh, really? Okay. So yeah, one of my questions is like, how do you feel about like digital tools as opposed to hardware tools for mastering? And you know, how do you how do you approach mastering like ambient music and, and, and experimental music where there's it's kind of uncharted territory? Exactly, and I, I can answer that in, in in several layers. I'll try to be brief though, because it'll probably make people's eyes glaze over. But um, <laughs> uh. First of all, I, uh, digital tools are fine. In fact, I prefer them because almost all of the files that are delivered to me are digital. And I find that the errors that are uh, in, induced by bringing things out into analog and back through into digital, you get phase problems, you get all sorts of uh, you know nonlinearities from the A to D and D to A conversion. I'd much rather stay in digital and I tend to. I have some good millennia uh, you know, origins here that I've used for analog mastering when it's needed, uh, but it rarely is. And I find that uh, the tools these days are fantastic. Isotope Ozone 8 is my main go-to uh, tool, and I've used Ozone since Ozone 4 or 3, maybe, you know, back in 1980, uh, 19, listen to me, 2005, I think, was when I started using it. The main problem with Ozone is it lets you do too much. It lets you go too far. So dial everything back. I treat mastering ambient music just like I would treat and uh, jazz or classical. In fact, the, you know, I'm not a, a gain junkie by any means, and I, I encourage people not to push things past, you know, reasonable peaks. Right? You know, use uh, a good look ahead limiter for safety, but you shouldn't see square tops of the waveforms. Right? You you want things to be loud enough, and you can use 
gentle compression. What I find is by putting EQ first, making sure that you don't have a lot of subsonic energy because that's going to take up all of your gain structure. One thing common with experimental music and with ambient music, partially because it's often done in home studios, people aren't monitoring well under 30 or 40 hertz, and they don't realize if their synthesizers are making monstrous low frequencies, and they're wondering why the meters are peaking, but it sounds quiet. One reason for that is that they've got a lot of inaudible low frequency material, and you can gently roll that off if need be. If it's not there, don't use a high pass filter because it changes the phase response of things. Just it, it, my, my approach is as transparent as possible. We have Michael Bruckner here, who I know he's, and thank you for staying up with us, Michael. Um, I mastered an album uh, that he did, uh, um, a, a duo project of theirs about two years ago, was it? Um, called the Radiant Seas. Um, yes. And with Hardy, Hardy is too here at the moment. Oh, oh good. I, 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 yes. Oh, excellent. Hi. Yes. Um, but it was a fantastic album. And it, Thank you. So, so I, uh, you know, I, I listen to music as a mastering engineer with a sense of what is balanced, what is working and what isn't, especially when it's experimental music or electronic music. I, I'm not judging the harshness or the, um, the difficulty of it. Um, I'm listening to it as a listener going, what feels balanced? And, and I, it's, it's an artistic decision. It's not a scientific decision. It's one that's aesthetic. Sometimes you might find that there's a slightly strident high frequency. If I remember in the Radiant Seas, it was a, a gentle dip around like eight or 10 kilohertz, a certain metallic sheen that was part of the electronics that as soon as I subtracted a tiny bit of that, like two dB, everything warmed up and it opened up in the mid range. Usually I work subtractively. I try not to boost signals that are missing. I try to hide the things that are overpowering it and to work subtractively. And I generally think of ambient music very much like an orchestra. Um, you know, where, where are things situated? Do you have a sense of deep uh, sound stage? Or, you know, you wanna be careful not to widen things so much that it becomes shallow because when you widen things, you know, the, the widening tools in ozone are amazing, but they can become front out of the speakers, which creates a hole in the middle. And what happens then is everything moves forwards into the speakers because you've widened it and you've lost your deep center, which is the mono in phase information, right? So you need to be very careful with some of these tools that can give you too much power. Um, the important thing is that you have what I call a proscenium so that you feel like you're listening to the music on a stage and some of the instruments are in the middle towards the back, some of them are towards the front. And because we're generally listening in two speakers, the way to bring things to the front is to bring them slightly out into stereo, which is, it sounds strange because we're usually taught that a solo voice or something is in the middle, right? A singer is usually mono. Um, but the fact is that when you bring stereo out of phase sounds further out of phase, they come forward and they sound more in front. So you have to be very, very careful so that your proscenium is intact and you've got this sense of spaciousness and sense of depth front and back, not just left and right. And so I'm paying attention to a lot of those textural questions. I would say that if there's one thing that helps me the most as a mastering engineer, it's that I'm somewhat synesthetic. Um, and I, I have a weird synesthesia where I feel sound on my skin. Um, and my album Tactile Ground was basically all about that. I mean, Tactile Ground was an orchestra of sensation. It was basically making sound that to me tickled or, or stroked or, or poked or scratched. You know, everything had a, tech, had a, had a sensory mirror in, in the tactile ground. And so when I'm mastering, I can sometimes sense if there's a problem on my skin, not in my ears. And it's a very strange thing to describe, but but as we get older, you know, our, our high frequency hearing gets attenuated. I usually test my hearing every year or so with, with frequency meters and stuff like that. And I, I know that I'm dropping off around 14 or 15 kilohertz now, which is pretty good for somebody almost 60 years old, but I, I'm aware of it. The weird thing is that high frequencies we can often detect with phase relationships. And so spatial relationships and uh, the, the positioning of things will get messed up when there's very high frequency problems. Um, also, I, I feel it on my skin and it's a very strange thing. So sometimes I find that I can use my tactile synesthesia to help me get what I find to be a balanced master without 
um, sitting too much on. I don't want to be visible. I don't want my work to be audible as a mastering engineer. I, I, I don't want to have a style at all. And so I, I do work on all sorts of things. Um, hopefully that helps. Now, Michael, you had your hand up, and I know you're having to go to bed soon. What were you going to ask? I don't know well, if somebody is. There you go. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, nice. Um, yes, thank you. That's uh, nice of you. Um, I have just, uh, I have to make up my mind to to put the question <laughs> because I'm not sure about the precise English vocabulary. It's uh, going back to the um, microtonal uh, topic. And um, I have experimented on and off with microtonality too. And uh, uh, at times, I, I, I try to construct um, scales based on the harmonic scale, but not using, obviously not using all the notes in the harmonic scale, but a choice and making a scale from that. And uh, one thing I found when I was trying to do the math <laughs> is that um, I, I think originally the harmonic scale is only sinus waves, right? So well, not the not, scale, but the, the harmonics themselves the harmonics mathematically are. Yeah, the, are the, the Fourier transform. Yeah. Okay, but if you have uh, some other uh, waveform than uh, a sinus, then you each of these tones has its own series of overtones. Mm -hmm. So I had the impression, but I'm not sure if it's correct. If you have like a sawtooth sound like something with a lot of uh, harmonics a uh, very sharp sound and you play uh, uh, on the harmonic scale uh, it tends to sound wrong to sound off key right because uh, because the overtones of the individual individual tones in the scale don't relate to the um to the, to the fundamental. fundamental anymore they, well, they, they do if they're harmonic. Yeah, so they do relate if they're harmonic. So it's a sawtooth wave. All of those overtones are yes. whole numbered. Actually, sawtooth is all the harmonic. So it's it's one hundred percent. And yeah. they they do relate in more complex ways. But our ears tend to simplify it. So what happens okay. is that our ears hear the fundamental, even though there's a lot of harmonics, which is one reason why ghost tones work so well on a harmonic scale. Yeah. My favorite harmonic tuning is a 12 through 24. So basically it's a 12 note, uh, one octave repeating tuning where you start with a fundamental frequency. Uh, for ease, I will use uh, an A55, which is A440 basically. Yes. And then you start with multiplying it by 12 and then by 13 and then by 14 and then by 15, all the way up to 24. Now you've, you've created a 24 note scale, which works out yes. very closely to a, a equal tempered octave. Um, and I can show you what that sounds like. Um, yeah. The fundamental will be harmonic 16. Anything that's a power of two is gonna be your fundamental. So if I show you that one, let's see here, it's gonna be this tuning right here. So this is a, Right? Mm -hmm. Fifth, yeah. fourth. So you can see it, it has some unusual character. I should have turned the, the, the camera when I was doing that, sorry. No um, it, uh, it has a beautiful, feeling of of stability and some very wistful especially i love that seven over four I'll, i can show you so so one of my favorite intervals is this is this seven here which is um this is the seven right here you see that's that's the 16 and so that's 14 right there you see so it's you know 16 15 14 14 being multiple of seven so you can get these just a lot of my music is in fact using that seven over four i i really like that that uh, very yeah. but so so the fundamental question though that you're asking is a debate within the microtonic 
microtonal community okay. that has many different answers and they're not right or wrong. There's a lot of opinions. Um, it goes back even to the questions of, do you stretch tune a piano? And, and this is when you have overtones that are actually out of tune with the fundamental, not just like a sawtooth wave, but like a gong or a piano, or in fact for yeah. Indonesian instruments that are metallophones and actually have inharmonic partials. People say, well, should you tune your tuning so that the inharmonic partials are in tune? And in general, the argument against tuning that way is that the ear resolves the fundamental in a dominant way so that the overtones become less important. They become heard as timbre, not mm -hmm. as pitch. Yes. Um, this is psychological. Yeah. It's, it's psychophysiology. It's not a rule. It's not hard and fast. So, so some people will argue that a stretched piano sounds better because you're aligning the fundamental pitches to uh, closer to the out of tune sharp overtones of the strings. And, and if you ask a piano tuner that, I've actually been yelled at. <laughs> <laughs> I asked if that was what they were doing and they said, no, it just sounds better. <laughs> <laughs> so I, when, when okay. I have my piano tuned, which is my piano is right behind the, the camera there, it's right there. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a little 1925 uh, AB Chase piano. Um, and AB Chase was a really good company that went out of business during the Great Depression. They didn't survive uh, the Depression because mm -hmm. like like even Steinway did not survive the Depression and, and Mason Hamlin did not survive the Depression. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that somebody revived the companies after the war mm -hmm. to, uh, to rebuild the companies. Nobody revived AB Chase. And so this little company that was mostly making very good pianos for wealthy people's homes when the wealth vanished, the company vanished. But it's a lovely little piano. It's the one I used for my album, Open Window. And I've used it sometimes in half speed for many of my albums since. So like the one with Marcus Reuter, um, Lift a Feather to the Flood is using this piano, but I'm half speeding everything I play pretty much. Um, and also um, a lot of my recent albums that have had piano is, is this piano. Um, but my piano tuner will come usually right before I do a recording session, which is sometimes only about once a year or two. I, I haven't had it tuned in like two years now. But, but he has a computer with algorithms for different stretches that, go, that, that analyze the harmonics of the strings and, and align them to an optimal um, range of stretch. And I've asked him to, to, in that optimization algorithm, to keep the stretch as narrow as possible so that it's as close to a pure two over one octave to a pure mathematical equal temperament instead of a big stretch because it has to conform to all the synthesizers which are all unstretched. But, but this question of overtones versus fundamental is, is not a trivial question. It's actually one that has no clear answer. And, and the, the strongest answer is that the psychoacoustics of the overtone series resolve down to the fundamental even though there can be out of tune harmonics. So that's, that's the shorthand. Did that help? Hopefully that helped. Well, I, I will have to think about it, but it was very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so yes, it, it did help. Thank you very much. All right, let's, okay. uh, let's move to Scott. So Scott, go ahead and unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Hello, um, I'm Scott. Um, thank you for the talk. My question is kind of about music history a little bit. Um, so I think you'll find this interesting. Um, I'm going to try to speak in an efficient way and try not to uh, be long winded. But um, it's kind of about this, this like Indonesian gamelan music, if you have anything to add on it, because when we were studying music history at uh, Rowan University for music, they divided music history into three sections, and it was basically the beginning of music until like the Renaissance, like 1600-ish, or like the beginning of Bach. And then um, the second class was uh, like from Bach to like the end of the Romantic era. So like 1880, maybe 1900. So that's like all of the classical music that anyone has ever heard of was in what they called Styles 2. And then Styles 3 
was like the begin like like Debussy, Wagner, Stravinsky, and on. So like Sios three is like all of you can argue modern music and one of the first things that was brought up in styles three class was when uh debussy went to one of the world's fairs around like 1896 1900 1904 something like that i think they were every four years um 1890 and, i believe is when he first heard the gamelon yeah that's exactly what i'm referencing so that seems to be so, like maybe seemed small at the time but comparatively such like a important influential moment for all of modern music and i don't know anything about what indonesian gamelan music sounds like or any artists to name or where its influence is or like like well, even any artists in. to 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 search because it seems so in such an important moment in music history that I'd like to know more about it. Let me jump in and and first of all say that that all of what you said makes sense if you add the word Western in front of any of the time you used music. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area where there's a wonderful ethnic diversity and there's also. Uh, a college of classical Indian music up in San Rafael that Ali Akbar Khan started back in the late 60s. And he's uh, the, the, the godbrother of, of uh, Ravi Shankar and uh, the half brother. Um, and radio stations like KPFA in Berkeley would play classical Indian music uh, at least several times a week. And I grew up loving and understanding more about classical Indian music than I did about Bach. I, I mean, I used to sing in church choirs as a kid, but when I first heard modal, Indian music, it made total sense to my brain, whereas triadic harmony was always somehow, I just didn't like it. To me, Mozart just sounded trite. It sounded like yeah. it, it was coming out of a, of a machine. Whereas when I first heard Harish Prasad Chaurasia play um, Bansuri flute, I, it made me cry. I absolutely, it, it ripped me in half emotionally. And uh, to this day, I, I think that, that we, in Western civilization are so blind to the traditions that have informed 90% of the population of the world. Um, for example, Chinese classical music has theoretical underpinnings that go back 3000 years, um, you know, but before Pythagoras even, and, or at least in the same time, in fact, Pythagorean and Chinese music, uh, Pythagorean theory are very similar. Chinese pentatonic, music is based upon a, a, a sort of Chinese version of Pythagorean math um, with string lengths and math and ratios and stuff. Um, there are lithophones, rock orchestras in China that have been uh, unearthed from, you know, uh, pa palaces that are 4,000 years old, um, like the clay warriors that are so famous in, in the, you know, so, there is, um, you know, if you, if you listen to the work of, of Harry Parch, for example, you can see a huge influence of Chinese opera. Um, also, um, like Japanese no gagaku music, um, which is a Buddhist influenced theater music. And it's, it's quite strident to Western ears. It's very, it's, it's edgy. It's rock and roll. I mean, it's, it's like listening to, it's like listening to New York scronky loft jazz. I mean, it's like, <laughs> You know, people going, yeah, yeah, dum, dum, dum. It's, it's insane sounding to a Western ear. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, and there's uh, amazing traditions of uh, classical music throughout Asia that go back thousands of years. Um, Korean uh, Kamungo performance techniques. Um, and, uh, and Indonesian gamelan is just one of many of these efflorescences of human culture and it uh was around when the dutch first colonized indonesia in the 1600s 1500s there was already a full-on uh you know metallophone orchestra system throughout bali and java and other islands as well um and uh of course it required metallurgy and so it was only after the um you know, the Iron Age, really, although I think there were bronze gongs and things 
long before the Iron Age, but there were mostly a requirement for, uh, for, for good metallurgy in order for these instruments to happen. But bamboo um, Do you want to? Pallet instruments also, you know, have, have been around for, there's, there's Thai orchestras uh, that are all made of bamboo and it sounds like gamelan music, but it's with, with bamboo. I recommend a, a record label from Japan called King Records. And most of their albums are probably out of print, but they are exquisite, often binaural recordings of um, uh, of traditional Asian music and South Asian music, a lot of it, um, audiophile label. Um, and many of these are probably out of print now and hard to get, but you might be able to find them online. Um, also, you know, we can't forget, you know, the music of, of uh, uh, pre-Columbian Americas. And uh, we, we don't know a whole lot about it. I know that... Um, some of the folks, uh, you know, like Jorge Reyes and uh, Antonio Zapeda made an effort back in the 80s to try to unearth, you know, some of the the, the instruments around the Museum of uh, Culture in uh, Mexico City, the Aztec Museum. Antonio Zapeda first uh, started looking at some of these um, ocarinas, uh, you know, clay flutes that are from in, uh, the Mayan times. I've got some out in the other room. I'd have to go and fish them out to to show you some of these things. I've got some double double ocarinas that play two notes at once. Um, and so, you know, and both Antonio Zepeda and Jorge Reyes made uh, music, you know, with trying to reverse engineer, you know, trying to interpolate what this music might have sounded like, uh, shamanic rituals. And, uh, you know, it, I, I think it's one of the biggest things for me has been to jettison any concept that Western music is anything more important than everything else in the world. And also be very sensitive uh, to what we'd call cultural appropriation. In other words, uh, th th there is a, a problem, I think, with... Um, uh, I'm seeing some waving. Hi. <laughs> oh, Michael. Yeah, I guess. Uh, bye, Michael. That's um, so a, a problem with the ideas that, that we are somehow the, the arbiters of, of tradition and culture and that, that everything else is something to be digested, is, to, is something for us to put into our machine, churn up and spit out as Western music. And I think that there's a lot of arrogance with that. Um, and I very strongly find myself in a position of perpetual learning and a perpetual humility about the extent of advanced language of, of music that is throughout human culture. And when I approach those things, I try to do it with uh, humility and with a, a sense of gratitude. Uh, and rather than putting it into my Western machine and resampling it and spitting it back out as Western music, which I think, you know, it's, it's especially a problem with like um, drum and bass, for example, you know, like a lot of the style of drum and bass where they'll sample Arabic prayers or, um, you know, Indian singing and they'll they'll stick it into a dance beat and make it sound anything psychedelic exotic. yeah anything exotic that's right and and all it's doing is adding a sort of it's you know it, it's a cliche exoticism and it's a it's a shallowing of of something that's a very deep tradition um so i, I definitely more align myself with terry riley's approach when back in 1969 1970 he and lamont young uh discovered a a, a singer um Pandit Pranath, who was willing to teach Western students um, the, the Sufi style of, of North Indian classical music, and um, and they apprenticed themselves to him as humble students. And and Terry Riley was given a lot of grief in the Western classical community for abandoning Western music. And his argument was, look, we have access to this tradition that is so deep and you know, and, and it would be ridiculous to pass it up. And so he basically abandoned Western music for 20 years or so for, and well, about 10 years until 1980, he started writing string quartets for, for Kronos Quartet. But, but people criticized him harshly for, for studying under Pandit Pranath so intensely. Um, and, and I think that that was a blind sightedness of a Western um, arrogance. And, and so, so when I'm, influenced by these other cultures i'm trying to do it with with a respect which is very hard to put into words or even um i'm not even sure if i'm doing it right in my music but i'm trying to keep the music as a 
trying to help the music serve something that's bigger than it is. If that makes any sense. I'm not really sure how to put these into words. Yeah, thank you. That was very thorough. <laughs> so appreciated. Sure. Samuel. Well, that's Hi, um, uh, and can you hear me? Yes, very well, thank you. All right, great. Uh, I hope not too well. Um, so one of, my, one of my favorite things about your music is um, a, a lot of it has, to me, a, a sort of a, a lack of perceptible meter. Hmm. Um, and forgive me if you've already covered this because I came late, but... Um, but like so like for for most you know like for in, in western music we have kind of like a clear playbook for how to to incorporate uh, how to compose with meter how to how to notate it what i mean what, what do you like how what are what are the units of meter that you think of, that you think in when you I can definitely answer that uh, very precisely probably boring people to death uh, so i I do not tend to think in terms of the Western counting system of one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. I much prefer um, the, the Indian Tala, which is a longer cycle, um, which could be 14 or 18 or, you know, some crazy people who can count better than me do like 23 and a half, things like that. You know, if you, if you uh, hear Zakir Hussain playing tabla, you know, and, and I can't figure out how they keep coming around to exactly the right start of the Tala each time. Um, but essentially, I think of rhythm in a similar way that I think of tuning, and that is in terms of ratio. And in my basic fundamental unit is the one. So, so I basically have a pulse, and and we could call it an eighth note pulse in my head. It's a dun 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 dun, and there's it's not dun 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 or dun 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 dun. It's not a march. It's it's just a count. Okay, just keep a tempo. And now. What I like to do is to find looping patterns that play nicely against that one. And so I might, I might break it into loops of five or seven or three. And there's certain polyrhythms, just like chords in music, like, like I love the seven against four chord. And it turns out that a seven against four polyrhythm is exquisite. And is that an accident? Well, maybe it's, it is because I'm not sure that, that, tempo really matches the same or that not tempo that that timing counting is the same thing in higher frequencies when we hear these harmonic chords as it is in terms of rhythm but i have favorite polyrhythms three against five is a favorite polyrhythm um, and you can start with the very simplest polyrhythm which is the two against three and you can do it on your pants which is and what i'm doing here is basically if i do it on a surface here it's it's not dun da da dun. It's not I'm not playing the Bo Diddley beat. I'm actually going with two different hands. Right. Now I'm not good enough with my independence, like some great drummers that can go three and five, but if I go one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five. And so that's my count. I can record something that I'm doing that on, you know, on the computer, and then I can go back and then I can try a three count, you know, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. It's, I'm not quite good enough to go one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, one, two, three, you see. But but that's how I think about rhythm is often in terms of these cycles. Um, this, is, this is pretty hilarious because like, I'm sitting here enjoying like the, like the, the, the liberation from the oppressive, you know, like backbeat or something like that, right? Like, and, and you're counting your ass off. <laughs> yeah, I had no idea. Well, and sometimes it doesn't involve a count. So, like, there's times where I pray rhythms that are intuitive, and like, th there's a piece of mine that's on troubled resting place uh, uh, called Night Sky Replies, and I'm playing an ud. I can reach out over here just a second. I'm going to reach in the back of the corner of the studio here, and grab an udu drum. I'm, I've been working on some percussive stuff lately, so let's see. grab this. And here is a ceramic drum. And I'm playing this drum on, look, see if I can trip over some wires while I'm at it. So I can show you something here. Uh, sometimes it's intuitive. So I'm not actually counting, right? So sometimes I'm actually just feeling it. And let's see if I can do this without it falling over and breaking, uh, something like this. Um, so. So there's a nice little 
I don't know if you can hear it through the uh, vocal mic. Let's try this. And, and this is like the bayan of a tabla. And this is like the tabla. And so sometimes I'll do rhythms that are much more open and almost uncountable. And these are in my mind, and it'll be just kind of this sort of So I refer to those rhythms as the penny and the dryer rhythms. And I'll, exp I'll explain what that <laughs> means. There's a certain phenomenon that happens a lot in nature where, where you get a random ticking sound. You know, it might be an insect out in a tree, or in this case, like if you lose a button on one of your clothing and it's go spinning around in the dryer and you hear this kind of syncopated, random, but pulsing rhythm. And it's one of my favorite rhythms in the world. And so often, I'll try to play or I'll, I'll do modular synth rhythms using random triggers that are all being clocked, but with, with different amplitudes. And so you get this kind of, you know, if you just picture in your mind, the button in the dryer effect, kind of this. And it's not repeating. But mm -hmm. it's still rhythmic. It's still pulsing, and and that's where that one one it comes in, and so you don't have to land on a bar line. You can impose whatever rhythm you want over that, and it's going to keep shifting and playing against it in a beautiful open way. And I love that dance because to me those rhythms don't get tiresome, and I think it allows. I, I'll, I'll say here quite frankly that I think much of my music is very simple. So it's, it's, as I said earlier in the beginning, like Indian music, drone, melody, and, and rhythm. And the rhythm is cyclic, not counting like Western bar lines. I don't count bar lines. In fact, I drive bass players crazy. I've, I, <laughs> I, I've, had, I've, I've tried to bring bass players in to play some of parts on my albums and, and I would play the parts on keyboard or sometimes I, I will play the bass line but they'll keep saying, you're not starting on the one, you know, you're starting on the half before the one or something. And I go, I, I don't know. It just sounded good. <laughs> so there's a piece on, on the bio where I brought a really, really good bass player in and, and he was, he was just uh, frustrated. So I ended up just using my, my scratch part um, because this bass line kind of went. And it wasn't, it wasn't going bump 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 it was it was it was going down on the half and up on the the two <laughs> and and so um oftentimes th these things come just from listening to non-western music but also um from from hearing things in my body and and not counting them too hard just trying to feel what what the melody is doing something that uh, my friend rick davies who actually there's a uh a a player who's on my album Seven Veils, um, who's playing a, kind of a ney flute, but it's a it's a caval, an Eastern European, uh, Romanian, Hungarian flute. But it, it, you play it through your teeth like a ney. It's really hard to play. And um, and and he was explaining that uh, in Eastern European folk music, like like uh, Romanian folk music, um, that it's really, really complex time signatures, but they're not actually counting it because the time signatures are going along with the lyric of the song. So the song might be about some beautiful maiden who was riding her horse and met some lovely man um, and was longing for him, you know, a typical folk song lyric. But but in the language, it might be dun dun which would be almost an uncountable, you know, you'd have to say, is that in 14, seven? Is it, is it going three and then five and then seven and then nine? And, and no, it's not doing any of that. It's actually just following the lyric. And so these, these musicians will be playing these incredibly hard, uncountable time signatures, but they're not counting them. They're going with the song. It's just the melody of the song and they're playing that time signature with the words. And so a lot of folk music is like that. It's playing very, very complex things if you analyze it in a Western sensibility. 
just like if you play com if you play modal music with some dissonance and you try to analyze it with western chord theory with western triadic theory it makes no sense right. because you're going what did you do that weird substitution you're saying what i just played a sixth over a seventh what's the big deal you mm -hmm. know yeah it was just an interesting transition you know so so i do th those kinds of things a lot i mean i'll show you what i mean it's like if you play like let me see here so so you'll notice in some of my music that that i'll i'll have these very modal things but it will be chromatic and modal at the same time so it might be something like if we play down here let me see are we out? Uh, can you hear that all right let me, let me go oh, yeah. over to, go over to uh this sound right here so i'll just play like let me go to a nicer sound just a second um try that one so um, I might just do simple things like this, you know. I want to turn off some of the, there's a little bit of clipping happening. Let me see here. If you were to analyze that from a triadic theory point of view, you'd have to just basically go to Schoenberg because it's chromatic. It's yeah. modal harmony mm -hmm. is what it is. It's very basic. And, and this is where people like uh, John Coltrane and McCoy Tyner in the jazz world have been so influenced on me because they're basically playing modal music, but it's it's 12 tone modal music, you know? <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> um, and, and that's what you're going to hear in Eastern European uh, folk music as well, is this exquisite, emotionally wrenching uh, modal harmony. And the expression is fairly free within uh, this language of, of vocal melody and, ex and expanded, expanded modality. So I'm not just sticking to Greek modes. It's not like, oh, this is in Phrygian mode or something like that. It's, it's kind of in a... And, and I've been doing a lot of this lately. I think... It ex started the most probably on my album, um, What We Left Behind and Vestiges, Tactile Ground. And that about five, six years ago, I started really expanding when I discovered how far I could go uh, outside of modal language. And and I really owe like uh, the modal jazz language of, of uh, Coltrane and things like, you know, to, to that level of, of territory. But, um, but yeah, I mean, so that's, I just went off into that tangent because the same thing is true with rhythm as it is with triadic harmony. If I'm sitting there trying to analyze what chords I'm playing on piano, it'll give everybody a headache because it doesn't make any sense to me either. Um, it's, it just sounds good. That's any other great, questions? thank you. <laughs> sure. Great, thank you. Very detailed answer, I appreciate that. Luke, you are up. Just going to check you can hear me first. Yes. Cool. Great. Um, thank you so much for doing this. It's really interesting uh, and unique opportunity to get an insight into, you know, your approach and and the work that you do. Um, so I might take my question slightly off track because judging by the comments that I've read and the questions I'm hearing, <laughs> your audience has a vastly superior technical knowledge than myself, uh, and so this is based on purely listening only because i'm still quite new to a lot of your work um, don't feel shy about that there's several people i know here in front of the screen that are just friends actually that aren't musicians at all so don't feel oh, cool no no that's that's good I knew um, <laughs> so i was just curious a little bit more about the other side of the creative process in terms of so I've only, I've only read a couple of your interviews so what i've learned is that obviously with each piece that you do in each album obviously there's this like journey that you take your listener on oftentimes um, so I guess really it's a kind of multi-layered question in that I was just curious as to what might inspire you to create a particular album 
Um, and then does it, is the process then quite organic from there? And sort of, yeah, just like what, where do you, where do you draw some of this inspiration from? So if you just look at offering, you know, the morning fog, for example, I, I read somewhere that that was very deliberately created for the time that we were going through at that, you know, last year and, and still going through. So there was something very thematic about that. And each of the albums generally, they're quite neat and in, in, you know, in, in a way that they thematize in that sort of way. But yeah, just what, I don't know, it might be quite difficult. To sort of... No, actually that's, I, I, it's more fun to talk about that stuff than about equipment and, and synthesizers and things. Cause I, I actually prefer those questions. Uh, I think a lot more about those questions than I do about the gear and about you know musical things. Um, it's a struggle. Uh, I, I've been trying to come up with new ideas every year for forty some years now, and it doesn't always come easily. Um, an album, some, I'm a little stuck on an album right now. It's taken me a good six months to get the, the batteries charged up after the last two albums. Um, so so yeah, I mean it's a very strident question for me. It's a loud question of how to stay motivated. And I, I do know how it works for me. I don't always know how to make it work for me, but I know when it's working and I know how it's working when it does. It's it's not a switch I can turn on and off though, and I wish I could. Um but what happens for me personally, and this isn't a rule about creativity, it's not the way everybody works. Um, it's just how I work. Um I need to constantly feed my curiosity with with um, science, with reading, with uh, you know just things that fascinate me. I'm a serial hobbyist. I'm a little obsessive about mastering things that are supposed to be difficult, like like watch repair or like uh, ceramics or painting. Or um, I I just I like I, I seriously get into hobbies. Put it that way. I'm, I'm a dilettante with a with an obsessive disease of of digging too deeply into things and that helps me it helps inform me with my curiosities um so when i start going down some dark pathway of curiosity i know that i've discovered maybe a new route to go down to to fetch some water underground you know um i think a lot in terms of like spelunking cave exploring um, and I think of the unconscious mind as a little bit of a cave with wonderful miracles hiding in it. Um, and, but like cave exploring, it's a little scary at times. And sometimes you run into very dark, narrow places that are sort of slimy and wet. And, and my unconscious mind is a little bit like that. Um, but when I find that new pathway to dig a well into this subterranean ocean, um, I, I guess my metaphor that I'm using here is sometimes I feel like we all as individuals imagine ourselves isolated, you know, sort of out in this desert of of life that feels very alone and very hard sometimes. And, and especially nowadays when we're so, you know, inundated with dark news about what humans have done to the planet and things like this, it feels more and more like a desert every day. I feel in this metaphor that to survive spiritually or or as an artist in specific terms we need to find our own little oasis in this desert um, and when we're really lucky we can find a few of them and in that oasis there's a spring that's coming up from deep deep underground and we each can learn how to dig a well down into that un, you know a, a subterranean ocean of 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 awareness or of life of creativity and we each have personal tricks that we use to find that oasis and to stay there or to to dig wells if we can't find one, you know. And so I'd say that my curiosity is a way to dig wells. And when I become obsessed by something, it's usually the sign that that's going to be something that my next album is going to involve or it triggers inspiration. Um, sometimes it could be very dark stuff. So. I think one of my best albums in the last 10 years is What We Left Behind. And, and that album is really about my sense of pain uh, regarding the human race and how we're messing things up. We are the big extinction episode. You know, we are as bad an extinction event as the Chicks the Club meteor impact 65 million years ago. Um, so that sense of, of 
I guess, guilt, that sense of frustration led to, um, you know, I'm fascinated by biology, I'm fascinated by evolution and the idea that we too will be extinct. And the feeling that the earth itself is very resilient. And so I tried to use those ideas as a way to dig myself up out of what was basically a, a real depression, um, a sense of, of despair, to be frank, ab about uh, the human condition and about the condition of our planet. I feel that we need as artists to provide some pathway to hope. We can't just be despairing, right? There's the only way to create change is to create a sense of possibility. And we're not going to do that just by laying down and crying, which is sometimes what I feel like doing. So, so that album was specifically a project to try to create something hopeful. And, and I, ironically, that hope was a very misanthropic forward looking vision of the earth without humans realizing that in a few million years, if we're extinct, the earth will recover eventually. And, and it will, it will be green again, you know, once we've done our damage, we'll be gone. And I had a sort of shamanic dream. I, I had a, a vision of, well, one of my obsessions is crows, by the way, ravens and crows, and I feed our, our local crows, and I'm really good friends with a couple crow families here. Um, so that's an aside, it's a very strange little hobby of mine. Um, I love wildlife. I'm a, a sucker for animals. And so I had this vision of a raven coming to me in a dream. I, I get a little emotional. It's a very intense vision for me. Um, and offering me a ride on its back across the planet without us. And saying to me, it's okay. You know, what you did was not so good, but you left us with a lot of food. And we who eat the dead, we have plenty to eat. Thank you very much. Um, because of course ravens are scavengers, you know. But, <laughs> um, and this idea of the album being on the back of a shamanic dream bird, diving down into places around the planet and seeing it thrive. That's what that album is. So the problem was, every time I would come up with very dark sounds, very brooding performances, I didn't have a place to put them because that album was about hope. So I had a shelf in my brain, a, a, a folder on my computer, where I put all the stuff that I couldn't handle because it was not the uplifting, hopeful album I wanted to make. And then I knew I was going to have to open that box because it was there. It was festering, right? We need to, to pick at the scabs, you know what I mean? <laughs> so the sequel to Troubled Rest, uh, I'm sorry, the sequel to What We Left Behind was what was in that folder, which was called vestiges, quite literally because it was the leftovers of what we left behind, but it was all the stuff that I put in that folder because it was too bleak. It was essentially the stuff dealing with the emotion of what we're doing right now and our loss and our destruction of the planet. It just so happened that the same year I started work on vestiges was the year that uh, I helped uh, my mom get diagnosed with, with Alzheimer's. And we had to put my mom in a, in a care facility. And just six months later, we had to put my father in that same care facility because he was getting very sick. He couldn't handle himself either. They were both in their 80s. Um, and so my mom had Alzheimer's for the last few years of her life. And that album became about uh, finality. It became about Alzheimer's. It became about loss and the loss of self, the loss of one's own sense of being. Um, and so for that album, Vestiges, the metaphor became a boat without a rudder on slack tide. It wasn't in a storm. It wasn't getting lost. It wasn't, n nothing horrible was happening. It just had, it had no there there. It was just, a, it was empty, slack, like a ghost ship. And uh, dealing with that sense of direct loss, metaphorically, in the art, but quite tragically, realistically with the loss of my parents, um, which everybody, we all have to deal with that, right? It's something that being alive, we lose our parents if, if, we, if we outlive them. If we don't outlive them, then they're the one that have to deal with that tragic thought. But um, so Vestiges became quite literally contending with all of the dark forebodings that what we left behind had to set aside. And that's part of the creative process. It's sometimes 
the art itself takes you kicking and screaming into it and says, no, you have to do me now. I'm sorry. I know you wanted to do something else, but now it's time you've got to do this one. What happens is that the music takes over. Um, it builds a world inside of you that starts growing like, like, a ba like a gestating baby, really. It, it becomes a new life that, like a child when it's born, it has its own mind. It has things that it wants to do, and sometimes you can't really teach it otherwise. <laughs> and so there are times when I'm dragged, kicking and screaming, into albums because they need to be made. And there's other times that it's like, you know, it's, it's, it's like pulling teeth, trying to make something happen in, in the studio here. I will walk, there will be weeks and weeks where I will walk into the studio, stare at the computer, try something, don't like it, listen to something I did last week, don't feel anything, try to make a sound, get distracted by Facebook, you know, the routine. And th that's the only way I can get out of those depths of emptiness is to start having the music grab me by the ear and drag me through the dust, you know, drag me out and say, look, make me now. I need to be, I need to happen. And, and that's the creative process in a nutshell right there. It's just being dragged around by your art and kicked, <laughs> kicked by it until you've made it happen. <laughs> Absolutely. All right, Tan Tantronic, you're up next. Hello, can you hear me okay? Yes, thank you. So I don't really have a question so much as I just wanted to, um, Sort of confirm <laughs> a lot of what you just said. Well, everything really. Um, the it, it all started my when I raised my hand. What I was actually thinking of at the time while I was still listening to you was the whole um, idea of the rhythms found in nature. And just to go back a bit to that idea of um, durational and durational aspects of the understandings that we have when we go out into the forest and just listen. You know, we're not confused by what we hear as things enter into our audioscape, right? We're not like, oh my God, that, I was totally unprepared for that sound in a bad way and now I'm confused, right? So we accept a certain cacophony and we accept a certain amount of structure that comes from all the different component parts that are these individual voices, each with their own rhythm. So yes, the, I totally relate to the, uh, to the penny in the dryer, the button in the dryer. So that's, I, I, in fact, the music I'm working on now is entirely based on field recording, my own audio field recording. So I work directly with, um, with audio instead of making it do what I want it to do, I have to let it do what it allows me to do. Hold on one second, turn off the speaking. Um, so <laughs> in doing this, I also end up coming up with textures and colors and things that are, you know, the sort of dark that someone might hear and go, oh, that's dark, you know, where's the optimism? Um, <laughs> so, so sometimes I find that a particular work wants to move to the light and sometimes maybe it wants to stay in this place that is neither dark nor light, but it's a unique space that we all occupy at one point in our life. Just like what you're describing. I'm sorry to be off camera and all weird about that. I just wasn't prepared to be on camera. I kind of forgot about this. So I'm just- It's like, okay. That's I'm okay. totally with you. I'm looking at your smiling face and I'm feeling like, like I'm talking to you. Trust me, I'm very self-conscious about my <laughs> appearance on these things. Like, um, there's actually a whole article about Zoom lighting and what it's doing to people's self-esteem because <laughs> no one's used to seeing themselves talk. It's like, oh my God. Anyway, so so as these, you know, going through life, I feel like there's a move, there's been a movement in my compositional work away from feeling like I have to control things to first wanting to see what's there and then seeing what I can do to channel and bring out what it's telling me to do. And I feel really privileged to work this way because it's it's really kind of uncharted territory. Not a lot of people work this way. In fact, I haven't found anyone that works the way that I do. So it's kind of cool. Um, and I have lots of free reign and people generally hear my stuff and don't really know how I made it. Like they're kind of surprised. There's no voices in it. They're kind of surprised. I didn't use any synthesizers. But there's just a lot of sound within sound. What can I tell you? And our digital uh, technologies make it possible to find all kinds of goodies in these dark and slimy caves, as you described. So sometimes there's emeralds and crystals and things like that. And so I get to dig around in those sort of experiential sonic realms. But to me, it's very analogous to 
kind of everything you described about the human experience that there's this aspect of our being that's simply here without any real control. And we're trying to figure out how to successfully be in this world. And right now, I mean, I don't mean material success, just be here without going crazy and you know, having a reasonably functional life and maybe, you know, contributing to the cultural landscape and for all of us here, you know, want to do that in one way or another. Um, but the reality is that, you know, yes, previous generations have said, oh, these are the worst times and the kids these days and all this, you know, everything's going to hell in a handbasket. Well, everything is going to hell in a handbasket now. Like, it has arrived, you know, yeah, it feels really different. And when I work now, I feel like I can't pretend I don't know that. I can't pretend I don't know that. Now, sometimes I might think, gosh, someday am I going to write something goofy and fun and happy? Because, you know, I feel that way sometimes. And I want to reflect that. But I feel responsible to create these works that speak to this kind of wordless experience of not knowing and of being in a state that is not our normal state of being. But you said well, something. I think we know what we're doing when we. Yeah, really you know. said something good a few minutes ago, which was that, uh, you know, that we live in a state that's between the light and the dark, and yeah. and it's one or the other. Yes. And and I think that as artists, you know, when we seek something that we find to be truthful or beautiful, it has to contain both those elements. It has to contain light and shadow. Right. Otherwise, it's insipid, right? Yeah. And I think yeah. most of us sense that. Um, and I think that a lot of a lot of what differentiates serious art from entertainment art is is the willingness to embrace the complex moods of of life and death you know light and shadow and if we can successfully incorporate them in a way that that somehow creates a metaphor of life in a beautiful way that 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 puts us here now in a sense with meaning then we've accomplished our goal as artists it's a it's a tricky thing to do i don't know how that actually means in every different person's art and the other thing that's tricky is the whole art versus entertainment thing, which I think growing up from an academic background and then kind of chucking that all and going into an entertainment background and writing music for shows and for stage shows and casino shows and all the stuff that was very much not what a nice classically trained person does, you know, and then going off from all of that into this very experimental stuff that I'm doing now, it's like, well, what, you know, what am I exactly? And I remember... Yeah. I remember this mastering guy that I've, I'm so fortunate to work with. He's like, you know, Tanya, the thing about your music is that you're you're more making, you're more an artist. You're on the artist side of things as opposed to the entertainment side of things. And when he said that, it was like such an obvious distinction that I had been um, hesitant to make because I don't like those kind of silos all that much. And I felt right. like I've been rebelling those silos my, you know, for the past few years. And all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, I see yeah yeah if i had to put my cards down in one basket or the other i guess i'd be forced to choose artists. Yeah, i had that similar challenge yeah. i remember uh when i was an undergraduate at stanford i spent a year studying at ccrma and uh and i saw that the academic music system really had more to do with with conceptualizing your work in such a way that you could get a grant and then the work that came so out of it was you had the cool you had the cool teachers then yeah we didn't talk about <laughs> well, that it's like you're well, awesome. some really good like <laughs> No, it's just what I noticed. But people like Chris Chafe were pretty awesome, actually. And, and there were some amazing people up there. And many of them did end up going. And I mean, uh, a guy with the opposite name of mine, his name is, is Robert Poor instead of Robert Rich. Uh, he went in, he was a grad student at CCRMA, and then he started joining like art pop bands in San Francisco, which became somewhat well known at the time. Um, so I, the thing is, I was faced with that question, and I, I was, you know, looking at this awesome computer system at the time that I could have composed with and I didn't get much done on it. And I found myself splitting that same gap that you're talking about as somehow a foot in the academic world and a foot in the in, in the the punk industrial noise making world. I mean that's really where I was starting was like throbbing gristle and right, space. Right, right. And, and and what I decided is that my own natural predilections were that I wanted to talk to the public and I wanted them to buy my music because it was a direct vote that they were interested in it. Whereas yeah, yeah, yeah. academia yeah. was somehow, you you had to make something that people didn't like so that you would justify the grant money. Right. <laughs> and, and, and having an academic piece that was somehow fun to listen to was, was kind of not considered cool. <laughs> you know? well, and also there was this idea that you can't trust your own voice. It was very weird. Like yeah. You can't trust your own voice and, and you have to, you know, master all these things and do all this stuff. And those are the things that everyone's telling you what to do. And then you realize as you go through life that 
there's all these people that are really so damn sure that they know exactly what you need to do to be allowed to do other things. So then you realize, no, they don't really know what they're talking about up to a point. Yeah, I, I find what you're trying to express and then find the people who can help you learn how to do that or learn it. It's not all malarkey, but there was more malarkey than I would have ever expected because I venerated the institution. Believe me, I was yeah. a total. And, and now I, I'm not sure I can ever go back. I, I find it strange that I actually really like the idea of putting my music out there in a commercial medium, like putting out a CD or a, something right, that people have to right, buy, right. because it, it provides a kind of real life um measurement of yeah. I, mean, the thing. I, I don't need people to love what i do it's not like you know i i, I kind of hate the narcissism of, of marketing of music and things i'm getting to be honest i'm getting really tired of it i i'm almost just I, i'm becoming more and more of a hermit just because i hate self-promotion yeah. um it's part of the brain i think it's not the it's it's everything that's left over after all of your creative juices have been sapped <laughs> <laughs> yeah but, but the idea still that that people will say, wow, I really like your album. To, right. to me, that kind of direct feedback to an audience, um, I, I absolutely prefer that to sitting there just coming up with concepts and having grant money to realize them. Sure. I, I'd much rather the music somehow straddle that, that earthy place of, of human endeavor and, and cultural, the swamp of, of culture, you know what I mean? I actually had someone say like one of the nicest things that anyone's ever said to me. And this was a woman who's now 28 years old when she was 14 through family, she met me and her, <laughs> her mother said, I gave her my album at the time. And the mother said that it was demonic, demonic. And, uh, <laughs> and yeah. Kelsey said, Kelsey's like, I said, give it to me. I think it's really cool. And then <laughs> she said, she listened to it. She says it was one of the most influential things to her as a creative person ever, because it showed her all of these different possibilities. She's a, a visual artist. She says, it just opened up my mind to all these possibilities. And it was like such an influence. And I'm just like flabbergasted as I'm reading her. This is all in text. She's sending me this. And I'm like, oh my God, like what a privilege to have someone tell you that that you brought like some brightness with your demonic music into their uh, troubled teenage years. Like that's pretty cool. And yeah, yeah so I know what you mean. That direct feedback, it, it makes you realize that you've sent a message in a bottle out there and someone received it, read it and understood. Yeah. Should we open up the questions? This I think Todd is sitting here waiting for to ask a question as well. I see his hand up. Is that right, Todd? No, not to cut you off, uh, Tom. No, no, Tom. I, I could, you know, chat with you. I, a um, bit but time. I'm thinking th there might be some more uh, wide, some more other give and take people would ask. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, and I'd asked a question before, so I'm being a little greedy here. I apologize. But uh, else who hasn't had a question already has a question. Um, I, I, I just wanted to ask, I've always been fascinated by your sleep concerts. Um, and I was able to attend your last one at the Rotunda in Philadelphia. And uh, it, was, it was an experience that really stuck with me. Um, I recall at the beginning, you, you gave a brief explanation and you talked about like, the point of this is not like to make sure you sleep well, you know? Um, it, it's to kind of induce a hypnagogic experience, you know? Um, a, kind of this weird state between sleeping and consciousness, you know, and indeed, I don't think I really slept that much or I slept very lightly. It, it, um, but I remember, at, you know, at the end of the day, um, when I was driving home that morning, I felt like I had a really good night's sleep. I, I felt like really awake and alert. And, uh, you know, it, I, I, I have a terrible sleep schedule. So I, I rarely feel that way um so uh it was just quite quite an experience and it really had an effect on me and so my question is I, i'm just wondering like how do you prepare for that like uh, creatively speaking how do right. you how do you prepare such a long form piece you know that, that takes place over the course of a night and and uh, what kind of um, considerations you take knowing that your audience is in this sort of unconscious state where they're not attentively listening to your music? Well, there's a couple layers of answers to that. First of all, if, if anybody's curious about the, what I usually say before a sleep concert, um, they can listen for free on Bandcamp uh, if they go to the album uh, Sleep Concert at the Gray Area. 
there's about a 10 minute introduction uh spoken introduction on that album which you can listen to without buying the album you can just you can just play it and and it's not the music it's just me talking uh and it, it is the recording of the introduction that i that i typically give every time um and you're you're right it's not about sleeping deeply uh it's about well that word i use spelunking it's about cave journeying into your subconscious and exploring your mind in a in a halfway alert state where you can sometimes find yourself free associating and um as a as a teenager i used to find myself doing that a lot i would set up you know modular synth patches that would sort of play themselves with little bleep bleep you know critter noises birds and insects sounds and um and i would just let it run for days and i'd you know it would just be in my bedroom uh in high school and and make you know low level sound and i found myself um oddly as a teenager able to to kind of lay on a bed close my eyes and have out-of-body experiences in a sort of state of half awake journeying um and it was that and the really long form approach to music where it just kept on playing i wanted to figure out ways of sharing that with people and then of course there were precedents there were you know uh, a, a lot of pre uh, a lot of sleep music had been done before mine or at least all night performances terry riley used to perform all night long back in the 60s usually aided with some <clears throat> chemical um induced <laughs> chemical awakening shall we say um it was the 60s after all and um and even before then you know navajo blessing ways could last three or four days uh you know for me medical rich shamanic medicine rituals and indian classical concerts you know raga concerts might last all night long depending on the hour that the music is meant to be performed. Uh, so there's many, many examples of this throughout the world, including Wayang puppet plays in, in, in Java. Um, and so the approach to, to answer your question about the approach to mapping that out is, is to break it down into chunks. And so generally what I do is start with the approach that there's going to be different energy levels throughout the night and to make judgments about where it's going to kind of be lighter and where it's going to be deeper and testing it on myself. So when I was working on Somnium first, I mean, remember the first sleep concert, I was 18 years old. I was a freshman in college. I did it in my dormitory back in 1982 in January. And so a, a lot of it was just whatever I could come up with. It was just tapes of recordings of creeks and birds and rain <laughs> and, and drones on the, on the synthesizers and things. You know, it was very, very simple because I didn't have very much um, but a lot of it was, you know, I had two cassette players, a looper, and um, and and a couple synthesizers, you know, the modular synth and the Prophet Five, and that that was about it. So, um, it, it, you know, basically that was purely improvised, and a lot of a lot of my music to this day is still very much improvised, but also relying a lot on nature recordings, as Tanya was saying. You know, sometimes this music benefits a lot from just listening, and uh, going out in the field and I, I do a lot of field recordings and to prepare for each of the recorded uh, sleep music releases I've done, which is Somnium and Perpetual, um, I would spend a lot of time, you know, up in the high Sierras backpacking or out on the coast trying to get interesting bird sounds or sometimes just in our backyard in the middle of the night or up in an open space preserve in the hills nearby, that kind of thing. Just trying to get interesting sounds, anything, you know, that, that I could find. And then a lot of processing, a lot of, um, you know, slowing things down, speeding things up, time shifting them, stretching them, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, and then when I would get chunks that were interesting that would evolve over periods of like 40 minutes, 60 minutes, an hour, um, or organize them on a huge timeline. So uh, in this case, I'm using logic and logic can handle, you know, a 10 hour timeline. And and I just take these chunks and move them around and slowly crossfade them, and, and and so I'm basically assembling it like Lego blocks now. I've 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 built these little sub assemblies of of moods, and now I'm sort of sliding them in layers until until the moods kind of transition smoothly, and then I'll try it on myself. And and my wife Dixie knows quite well that she, you know she'll she'll oust me to the living room on a futon or something, and I'll sleep out there with the stereo. Um, so that she doesn't have to deal with it, or, or I'll have headphones on, you know, and and that will help me get a gauge for the amplitude of the music, because I find at least that I can't sleep with music. I'm very, very sensitized to sound. 
And so if I can live with my master of these albums like Somnium, um, if I can live with it, then it's probably going to work for other people too, because I, I, I'm really bothered by sound. I have, I sleep with earplugs every night, by the way. So, I mean, I, I think the world is very loud for me. It's probably one reason my music is pretty quiet is, is that I just, I, I don't like loud noises and I don't like, um, I, you know, we live in a sort of urban place here in Mountain View, but I must say that I tend to prefer the countryside. Um, but, uh, Basically, I, I find the levels and the, the level of activity to, to shape according to the general pattern of sleep, um, which is to say that slow wave sleep is usually, you know, early morning hours, 4 or 5 a.m. Typically, it depends on people's own sleep schedule. Some people are wide awake at 5 a.m. and they're out to go exercise. I'm not one of those people. <laughs> but you know what I mean. So basically, the answer is to bring it out in chunks. And then when I'm performing a sleep concert, my main project is to stay alert and to just tune the room, to feel the room. And I have those same chunks on the computer. I've got the loopers, I've got a few instruments and I'm moving very slow motion slabs of sound around. And it's not live playing. It's not like I'm sitting there playing notes the whole night. Um, it's, it's really mixing. I, I'm mixing elements slowly together. Um, it's like slow motion DJ as it were. Hopefully that helps answer. Thank you. Yeah, that, that's fascinating. Yeah, and I just want to add, like, um, usually I, I guess I'm a very deep sleeper, um, and I wake up, I sleep too much or something. You know, I wake up, I feel groggy, you know. Um, when I went to a sleep concert, it was more of a light sleep, um, but it was like, I don't know, it's just very interesting. By the end of it, I felt more alert, I felt more rested, even though... I know necessarily again like a deep restful sleep isn't the point of it. I, I felt I felt like uh, refreshed after it, the concert. So um, I'd like to imagine that it's because you know, you know it, having uh, an artistic is, is a really great. Yeah, I'd like to imagine that sometimes when we're exposed to interesting that... art, it makes us feel alert. I mean, if I go to a museum and I yeah, see yeah. a painting, I, I feel energized, and I'm not yeah, sure. I... That, that... Absolutely, I concur. That's that's how I felt. So uh, thank you, thank you for your answer. Well, sure. Any other thoughts or comments or questions? Anybody wants to ask? We're we're just about up to two hours. We can go longer if people want. I see Neela has a check mark next to her name. Um, did she want to ask a question? If so, go ahead and unmute yourself. No, I I don't have any question. But I uh, somehow some of the talks uh, which Robert. Um, made um reminds me of the class i took i'm not a musician so that's like out of the way first so my comment will be very different so i took a class uh, about world music on coursera when they when they started it uh, which is like few years back and um uh, i it was so amazing because it introduces me the different music lullaby from folk from African music to Indian music to Eastern European music to all the way to classical music, so I just um, I just enjoyed when you were talking about um, your exposure to you know music in your life, etc. And just like fascinating for me to hear Robert in a different in a different <laughs> way in a different field. So anyway, I, I have no question. It. Neela is a, is in the circle of, of friends with with me and my wife and a few other friends. So we're, we're actually not. She hardly even knows my music, which is nice to see her here. <laughs> yes, yes, and uh, yeah. So I think, it, and also my son is um engineer and musician. So you know, I mean, he's like so. That's why I it, whatever the knowledge I can gain, it will mm -hmm. help me to communicate better with him. So you know, so that's why I'm here. But it was very mind opening. Uh, I enjoyed everything. So thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll ask one final question. Sure. Um, when people hand you masters, what are the errors that you typically have to contend with? Oh, well, that's a really interesting question. And I, uh, I, I don't know if I, I want to belabor these things, but okay. So 
several things. Very simple things are sometimes people are mixing in headphones and they don't actually know that their headphones are really nonlinear and that there's huge places in headphones that are peaky or have gaps. And so they won't even be aware that there's massive resonances in their mixes. And also ambiences tend to sound much louder and strange in headphones. So oftentimes having music with some air around it, having you know music that was recorded in a room is very natural and there's there's air and ambience and reflections around it. Um, electronic music, of course, hasn't generally seen that air. And so people have very strong opinions about how they're going to use echoes and reverbs and things like that, synthetic reverb. Um, some music needs no reverb, like dance music, generally reverb is a bad idea. You don't want to hear that kick drum splash, you know, but a lot of times if people are mixing in headphones, they're going to think that there's way too much reverb on their mix, but really there, there could be more. And so sometimes I will actually go so far as to add a very subtle little plate reverb behind things if it's not dance music you know, just to create a sense of depth or a sense of, of uh, softness or a, a sheen, as it were. But the trick is that those tr those kinds of additions need to be invisible. If, if you hear it, I did it wrong, you know. So it's a very strange little balancing point. Other things are um, people uh, will often end up with way too much low end because they're having trouble monitoring low frequencies or sometimes not enough low end. L low frequencies are the hardest thing because they they tune the most to the room. So, so the room you work in is the thing that will affect the way you hear low frequencies the most. Um, high frequencies aren't such a big problem. If you're going deaf, you might have no sense of what your high frequencies are like, or if your speakers are too bright or you know tinny, you might make your mixes murky and things. But in general, the problems in low frequency are much more common than problems in high frequency. I can often leave the high frequencies alone and just not mess up anything there. Um, other things are when people think too much in their head what their music should sound like, and especially questions of loudness, questions of impact, um, questions of distortion. So uh, this is especially a problem in the, the electronica dance music kind of world where these ideas that it had, has to be slamming way up into the, the peak zone of smash you know and also a lot of extra distortion and things like that and that's because people are so used to hearing that music on pa systems very loud that are already compressed just because the, the air is compressing it they think that that's the way it should sound because they think that the music is naturally compressed it's like it's like people doing hip-hop and rap music that think it should sound like a boom car you know because You'll, you'll you'll see these mixes that are all pre-distorted and pre-compressed and so it just goes this <laughs> kind of sound you go that's not what the music sounded like before it came out of the boom car that's what the boom car is doing to the music and so if your music already sounds like that it's going to sound like a soup it's really not going to have any impact and the boom car is not going to rattle the windows so you know you you need to start with something that's oddly somewhat audiophile in every category of music, even if it's a category of music that's famous for being somewhat grungy. Um, and what's happening these days, I think, with a lot of alternate mainstream music is that people are pre-grunging their masters, and then other people are listening to that and saying, wow, that's so cool, that's what it should sound like, and then they're doing it too, and then everybody starts upping this level of distortion and this level of clipping until everything gets fatiguing. And, and I find that to be tragic because there's a lot of really, really cool music that that would be more listenable if it didn't hurt. Um, you, you know, like I, an example of an album that people have used as a reference that makes me kind of sad is, is the Black Keys album with the, the black cover. I think it's called Brothers or something like that. Um, it's a really, the, the songs are awesome and it's a really, really cool album but it was wrecked on the way in. I mean, it's, it's like it, there's so much distortion in the tracking and, and the master that, th that there's really nowhere to go with it. And, and I think like, um, I, I don't know, uh, it, it's, to, to me, the, the loudness wars have already been lost. I mean, it's, it's a little bit like the, it's, it's like the, the atomic race. It's, it's, it's like the Cold War with, with the Soviet Union and the United States making more and more warheads to, to, to point at each other. And at a certain point, if any of those gets used, the whole world blows up, right? I mean, it's, it's an unwinnable war. The, the loudness wars are the same thing. Trying to constantly compress up against a ceiling that digital won't go over 
because somehow you imagine that that creates more impact in the music is is the biggest mistake still that I see for people who are making pop music or anything that they want to translate into kind of a commercial area. Luckily with ambient music and experimental stuff, we don't have that problem. And I treat it like classical music where I just bring the peaks up to the top and balance it out and it's, you know, no harm done. Um, for the most part, what I love to do with clients, with mastering clients is invite them if they are in person, if they're local clients, is to come listen to mixes when they're rough mixes in my studio and we'll go through the rough mixes and I'll suggest things to tweak the mix from the start because the best master that I can make is when the mixes themselves are near perfect um, because then I can just, just polish a little beauty, you know, just a little sparkle on it, not do much at all and everything will just kind of go poof and really, really jump out of the speakers. Um, and the best way to do that is have a really, really good balanced final mix. And so, so one of the keys for me is to work with people when they're still working on their album. Almost all of my clients, by the way, are independent, self-funded musicians. I, I work with only one record label, maybe, well, I've worked with other record labels in the past, but right now I'm only working with Lakeshore, which does soundtracks. So, you know, I've, I've mastered the soundtrack to things like, oh gosh, um, uh, even a Blair Witch Project, I mastered that soundtrack. <laughs> it was mostly noise music, in fact. And, um, you know, some other, a lot of dark and grungy, you know, horror movie things, slasher movies, which I can't stand. But um, so, you know, <laughs> I, um, yeah, a lot of, uh, you know, so, so I do a lot of the mastering for Lakeshore. But, but otherwise, almost all of my clients are just independent artists like you guys. And yeah, some of whom I wish I know, like George, and, uh, like George. <laughs> Um, Indeed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you, radio has a lot to, to br blame for this loudness war, I believe. Um, the compressors that they put just before the transmitters just induce so much harmonic distortion. It's unbelievable. And what people don't realize is that those compressors are designed to make normal music sound loud. And when they, when they see something that's over compressed with too much average volume, they just squish it down. They yeah, make exactly. it quieter. Yeah. You got to so, protect the transmitter. That's right. Anybody who works in a radio station knows that when they put in one of those smashed albums, then they, they just see the meters for the for the compressor just just slam down because they're just going, OK, you're too loud. And so it just makes it sound weak and distorted and it, it loses all the impact. Uh, I remember the first time I really noticed this was about 20 years ago and I was driving home from a long tour and I was out in the middle of the boonies for for hours driving in i was my last concert was going to be in los angeles i think or somewhere and i was driving in i-10 like through barstow from you know actually i might have been coming down from denver come to think of it and i was just coming into the la valley area and i thought you know i haven't listened to an actual broadcast radio station in weeks so i turned on you know one of those big rock and roll la stations it might have even been the rock or something like that and and I remember the experience of hearing two songs on my car radio. The first one was a Led Zeppelin song from Presence. I, I think it was Achilles' Last Stand, and I was blasting it, and it sounded so good. It was like, man, that is incredibly well-produced music. I hadn't heard the song in like 15 years or something. I'm not even a Zeppelin fan. And then the one after it was Red Hot Chili Peppers um, from, I, I think it was, uh, like maybe it was Under the Bridge or something like that. And, and it was mastered with Rick Rubin's smash, right? It was just squished to the top. And, and I had that, I had the radio set pretty loud to listen to the Led Zeppelin song. And the Red Hot Chili Peppers came on and it went boom. And then it was just this boom, 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 boom. And, yes. and was quieter. Even though it was mastered probably 10 dB louder than the Led Zeppelin, it was coming out the radio probably 6 dB quieter with pumping and with just and with distortion and and that's what they got for making a smashed master so i i think to me that was like when people talk about i want to sound competitive on the radio well then what you need to do is those orban compressors on radio stations are designed to respond musically to mixes that aren't smashed and so if you want to sound loud don't make a loud master allow the orban compressor to boost the music and make absolutely. it absolutely absolutely 
All right. Well, very good. This has been an amazing talk. I appreciate your time, Robert, so much. I appreciate it to everyone who joined. I see some folks clapping. Stephen, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank and you. And I, I just want to remind everybody that, uh, you know, Tempo, this organization that, that, uh, this this session has fallen underneath is uh, it's called Tempo or the Electro Music Performers Education uh, Organization and we're an emerging 503c not for profit organization that was created to foster and promote the development of electro music ethos through the organization and presentation of live performances seminars like this one lectures exhibits and gatherings and uh, so I, I put in the chat and I'll put it again before we all leave here. Um, a link to our Facebook page. We haven't built an actual actual web page yet, but I encourage you if you're a Facebook user to follow it. And if you're not a Facebook user to just check in every once in a while we, because we've been doing a lot of things like this. And if you as a participant of this um, think you have a topic that might be interesting to other folks like you, uh, we encourage you to reach out to us and uh, maybe you can be um, one of the speakers on one of our future uh, seminars. So thank you to everybody. I will post that link to the chat. And uh, any final questions or comments anyone wants to make? Well, I can say thank you to everyone. I see a lot of friends. I mean, I see Scott saying, waving hello over there. Goodbye, Scott. Thanks. And so many people here I've actually met on tours or even have put on concerts or put me up at their house. I saw Jesse say hello a minute ago. And... Uh, I see Zhou Xin here who helped me get an amazing gig in Hanoi, Vietnam in, in November 2019. Also an amazing modular synth player himself. Um, so uh, I'm really honored to have a bunch of old friends here as well as, uh, as, well as you know, just people that I meet around. It's, it's, it's a very small world we live in and I'm very grateful for all of you. And no gear questions, isn't that great? <laughs> <laughs> the problem, well, anyway, yeah, that's all good. So. Um, <laughs> Thank you very, very much, all of you. I really appreciate it. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Have a great day. Thanks, Rob.